Morena Church. We're going to get into some worship, so let's stand to our feet. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior is done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh,
No, I'm not back in town for many giants Cause I know how this story is Yes, I know how this story is I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory Everybody, you may have a seat. Thank you. Cool, cool. Hey, good morning, Activate. Welcome to our church this morning. It's so cool to have you here. Big hello to everybody uh, watching online this morning as well. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, any guests in the house this morning, my name is Josh, and along with the team, uh, we all lead here together uh, at Activate Christchurch, which is a lot of fun. I am on uh, keys this morning because our keyboard has turned up this morning feeling very, very sick. And so when you turn up to church feeling very, very sick, the pastor says, get out of here. Uh, and actually, our keyboardist was the backup to our original keyboardist. So this morning, I am the backup to our backup of the keyboardist. Uh, if you want to keep in touch with what we're doing uh, in the life of the church, uh, you can jump on to our Facebook group. We'll keep in touch that way. We also send out emails periodically. In fact, I was thinking this morning as I was driving in, I haven't seen, a, seen an email out for a while, so I should probably, probably do that at some point. Uh, we have got a lot of people uh, away today uh, with uh, a disease which I won't mention, but like a lot of people. I think it's the most people we've ever had away on one Sunday. So if you were watching uh, online this morning, just want you to know that we're thinking of you. In fact, why don't we just reach out our hands symbolically this morning and uh, we're just going to pray for everybody that is not able to make it to church this morning because they are sick, they got the flu, they got that thing, they got whatever it might be. Father, we just lift up everybody watching at home this morning or anybody that's feeling under the weather or under attack, God, and we just declare that the name of Jesus Christ is above every other name, every possible sickness, every possible illness, every possible disease, the name of Jesus Christ is above every other name. And we just release right now healing in the name of Jesus. We say to everybody watching this morning that has infirmity, and just reach out your hand. Oh, I feel like a, a televangelist. Reach your hand out to the 
screen this morning. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we just say, be healed. Fantastic. And so if you feel in your body right now at home, you're like, oh, oh, I just felt the healing. Run through my body, get up, come down to church. Um, because we're going to be here for the next hour and a half or so. All right. A uh, couple of notices uh, really quickly. We've got prayer meeting tomorrow night down here, uh, 7 o'clock. If you haven't been to prayer meeting, come down. Be a part of it. Denise runs a great prayer meeting down here. It's not like you just all get in a circle and take turns praying. There's all sorts of interactive things happening, and it's a great opportunity to actually grow uh, your faith as well. So that is down here tomorrow night. Speaking of Monday nights, we have got our prophet Steve McCracken here on Monday, the 1st of August. That is at 7.30, and we're opening that up to a number of other churches. So I'm expecting this place to be pretty chocker. Uh, as I say, we've invited the other X churches. We've also sort of sent it out to the wider prophetic network within Christchurch. So Steve is the, the real deal. He's a great guy. He's given me a number of prophetic words. He'll just He's the sort of guy that will just pick up the phone and ring you and say, man, I was praying for you, and I feel like God said this, and it's always unbelievably accurate. So he's a great guy to come and have a listen to. Uh, how about this? We've had another baby born this week. How cool is this? And they're just popping out like daisies. Uh, we've got Naomi Grace Dixon. So that is Michael and Miriam's brand new daughter. They are proud as punch parents. Seven pounds, seven ounces. How's about that for a, a holy number? All right, we've got grandparents here as well. We've got Ron and Janet. First time grandparents? Yep, oh, how's it feel? Pretty good? Yep, that's fantastic. First time grandparents. Um, so you can make sure you send them a text, and I think there's a bit of a meal chain going around as well, so Kira can talk to you about that. Kira, just give us a wave down the back. She's just sorting out her own baby stuff. It's pretty impressive. Have a baby, then you're on the meal train sorting out the next baby, so there you go. 13th of July she was born, uh, which is awesome. And in fact, speaking of babies, uh, we have got a baby dedication uh, this morning as well. So I'd just like to invite Gerhard and Rebecca and the family. Where are they at? There they are, over there. We've got some family here. All right, come up the front. This is cool. So this is something that we do in the life of our church is uh, we have babies, and then when uh, it is appropriate, uh, and it, there's no real rule around when you do it. Some people like to do it sooner rather than later. Some people like to do it later rather than sooner. But what we do here is we, we dedicate our children to God. And that's a different thing from baptism. Some of you might be familiar with baptizing uh, children. Other denominations, other faiths will, will call it baptism. Some will call it christening. But uh, it's, we call it a dedication because we believe that baptism is very much a decision that you need to make for yourself once you get to an appropriate age where you can kind of weigh up what you're doing and you understand what it means and the importance of it. That's when we do baptism. Uh, but dedication is not so much about lovely Haven Willow making her own decision. It's about the family and the parents saying, hey, God, we are dedicating our child back to you. It's about Gerhard and Rebecca acknowledging that Haven Willow is theirs to care for, but that she belongs ultimately to God. It's something that we saw Jesus' parents do in the Bible Joseph and Mary, they took Jesus to the temple and they dedicated him. Uh, it was something that we see within the Jewish tradition as well. It was For them, it was more reserved for the oldest child, but here we do it for all of our kids. How many have you got there, like 14? What? You've got a lot of kids, six kids. All right, fantastic. So uh, before we do it, uh, I think Gerhard and Rebecca would just love to hear from you guys. So Gerhard, first of all, what, why are you dedicating Haven Willow today? Well, as a family, we believe that um, we want to make a public declaration um, that we believe this is the right thing for us to do, um, to commit it before the Lord, to, um, to, to say to the world, I guess, in a way that, um, that as a family, we, we want to bring her up in the ways of the Lord. So that's really important for us that she um, is, pursues and follows Jesus, yeah, makes him the Lord of Savior, although... And uh, we are a big part of that, obviously, and stewarding and fostering that and discipling that. Yeah. Very, very cool. How old is she now? She's almost one? 21, yeah. Yes. 27th of July. 27th of July. All right. Now, you've got a prayer as well, Rebecca, that you wanted to, to read out. All right, pass here on. Here we go. Fantastic. <clears throat> Father, in Jesus' holy name, we come before you on this special day 
to present to you, to consecrate to you, to dedicate to you, to give back to you this haven willow that you've given us. Lord, we realize that we are only stewards of this special gift from you. Only you create life. This baby is your baby. This day before you and the host of heaven and all other witnesses, we come to present to you in solemn dedication, Haven Willow. We consecrate as parents to not provoke her to wrath, but to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We commit to you to train her up in your ways and that she won't depart from them. We promise to teach her of you, your ways, your word, your will. We promise to train her by example and demonstration as well as our words. We promise to discipline her according to your word. We promise to love and care for her and bathe her in prayer from this day forward. We commit Haven Willow into your care. You can be omnipresent. We can't always be there, but you can. Your angels have charge over her to keep her in all your ways and lift her up lest she dash her foot against a stone. We pray that Haven Willow be healthy, whole, complete, blessed and prosperous spirit, soul and body. We bind the forces of hell and the devil in Jesus' name to stay away from our family in every area of our lives. We decree that Jesus be enthroned above all else in our family at all times in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. Now you got some family friends here as well. Did you guys want to say anything or you all good? Sister-in-law? Oh, brother with the camera. That's fantastic. Did you want to say anything at all? Sure. Hi, I'm Esther. I'm Haven Willow's proud auntie. Um, Haven Willow, you are such a beautiful wee girl and you're wearing a beautiful dress and cardi today. Um, and that's awesome. And But we know that true beauty is on the inside and God has given you a really beautiful outside and inside, and you've got a really sweet and gentle spirit, and God is going to bless lots of people through you. Very, very good. Haven Willow, is a, isn't Haven Willow a beautiful name? Beautiful name for a young girl. You know, willow trees, I remember being told that if you plant a willow tree near a river, it just sucks sucks all the water, to the point where they say don't plant other trees near a willow tree because it steals all of the, all of the water. Uh, you know, and there's that psalm too where it says that he'll make us like trees that are planted beside a river. And so we just declare over you, Willow, that you're going to be uh, a young woman that grows up into a regular aged woman, I suppose, and then, you know, onto an older woman uh, who's just planted by the river of life and just, just draws, you know, her life from that river. All right. So this is like the, the formal part. It's just, I just think it's cool sometimes. Like I know that we're a pretty chill church. We kind of are pretty, pretty relaxed. But I think it's cool to do like formal stuff sometimes. All right. So do you, Rebecca and Gerhard, dedicate Haven Willow to God today? Yes. Do you commit to bring Haven Willow up in the Christian faith, teaching and modeling what it is and what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus? All right, church family, we've said this before, it takes a village to, to raise a child, especially if you've got six of them. As Gerhard and Rebecca are a special part of our family here, do we commit to praying for them and supporting them in the good times and in the hard times? Yes, we do. All right, you're part of the family. Fantastic. All right, where is she? Let me just, let me just, let me just put my hand on her head. Oh, you're gorgeous. Hey, blue eyes. Wow, she's looking at Dad like, what's this strange man doing? Well, right now, we dedicate you, Haven, Willow, Gabriella, Potgeeter, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we pray that the day will come when you accept Jesus as your own Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Very cool. Give them a round of applause this morning. Love that for you. There you go little wee certificate to prove that it happened. That's fantastic. And all right, one more notice too. It's time to say goodbye to the kids this morning. All right, stretch out your hands to the kids this morning. Uh, if you're a guest with us and you've brought children along, just make sure you've got them signed out at the back. But we've got programs running from sort of three years old up to 12 or so. And uh, we've got a self-catering creche and a new mum's room as well out the back to your right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our kids. Thank you for... Uh, just the joy that they bring to our lives 
And I pray a blessing on them right now and a blessing too on our children's workers this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, where you go. Why don't you stand to your feet again, church, and we're going to get into a time of worship this morning.
it out holy. God, feel your presence here. still in this moment we want you to speak we 
We're in uh, corporate worship together today. God wants to meet with you individually. We meet with each one of us individually. That he wants you to know that he sees you as an image. You're not just a number. You're not just a face amongst the crowd. He loves you. Intimately, desperately, unconditionally to meet with you here today so as we continue to worship that you just come into that place where you, we have to deal with God on our own you know we can't rely on our parents relationship or our family's relationship with God it's just you it's just us and him and he wants to come and just heal wants to come and sit free today and you have to take that step forward and just allow yourself to be alone and vulnerable, naked pitiful, blind and poor as we come before him in that and allow him to clothe us in righteousness to uh, bring new lease and new, new faith and new hope With a melody, you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my feet are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Your love has called my name. And I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer.
child of God. You split. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowning.
Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. Let me say that one again. My fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. My fear, my fear, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your Church, 
My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. You know, the uh, biggest weapon in the enemy's arsenal is fear. Fear of failure. Fear of what other people will think. Fear of letting God down. Fear of letting ourselves down. Fear of not being enough. And right now in this moment, I believe God is just wanting to break off that fear. Because it holds us back from life. If we really understood how much God loves us and really grabbed a hold of that, we'd live vastly different lives. We'd live more abundantly and more courageously, free from fear. And God wants you to be free from fear. There's no fear in Him. There's no negativity in Him. And He wants that freedom for you. And it's free and it's available right here, right now, at this moment. Just sing that refrain again. And really pray for yourself, grab a hold of it and and believe. Because it's for you. It's for you today, right here, right now. And um, God wants you to be free. chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your out all fear and there is no more perfect love than yours no nothing else compares to the love you have for your people your children so Father we thank you today that we can be free we can be no longer a slave to fear because we're your children we are adopted as, as sons and daughters into your family. And we just stand in that. We can stand free. We can stand 
free of fear today because of your grace and your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to take a seat, <clears throat> we're going to continue to worship by... Uh, Mr. John Pritchard coming to preach to us today, bringing the word straight from God's heart. Come on, you can do a little better than that, surely. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Bless you, mate. Yep. I've got a piece. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, we're going to get back to that theme in a few minutes, actually. Thanks for the songs. It's all right. Uh, Ash has got it under control, he said. He has got it under control. Now, yes, we're going to get back to that theme soon. Um, but today we're in the... Um, yes. It was working before. There. Um, today we are getting back to the fifth chapter of Acts, which we've been working through uh, over the last few weeks. And we've got another amazing incident in the fifth chapter of Acts that uh, happened in the early church. But before we get into that, I'd like to give us a little bit of background. I'm <clears throat> I am sort of painfully, so my kids always told me, I'm painfully focused on context. And, and that's a bit what I like here this morning, so bear with me, because it does give us a little bit of colour and meaning to the incident that's happening. You see, at this time in history, the, the Romans were in charge of Palestine, and uh, Herod the Great, who gave the order to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, uh, he was the king, but he had worked his way, or greased his way, as some might say, uh, into favour with Rome, who ru ruled, and he ruled parts of Palestine under the authority of Rome. And Herod the Great died while Jesus was in Egypt. You remember Mary and Joseph took Jesus and escaped out into Egypt, and while he was there, uh, Herod the Great died. But the uh, family of, of Herod the Great um, they became rulers in different parts, and there was three or four kind of areas that they were rulers. And, um, and then the Romans, <clears throat> they um, appointed other rulers uh, to take the places of Palestine that weren't covered by um, he uh, the Herod family. And so that's how Pilate got to be appointed as the governor of Judea, and Jerusalem was part of that area. And um, the family of Herods were descendants of Esau. And so that's Jacob's brother. So that was a recipe for strife right from the start. Uh, because the descendants of, of Jacob claimed that they were the true descendants right the way back to Abraham. But um, uh, the, the Esau line were claiming that they were the, the true descendants because Esau was the older brother of, of the twins. And, and um, J their mother and Jacob had plotted a little scheme to steal the birthright blessing from Esau. And that happened. And so the line came down through Jacob and not Esau. So well, that was a recipe for conflict. Now, all of these regions and kings and leaders in Palestine <clears throat> uh, uh, were supported militarily from Rome. And so if there was uh, any riots or any unrest or any uprising, Rome came and dealt with that pretty brutally. And uh, this happened several times until they raided the whole area in 70 AD and wiped out a lot of the people and destroyed the temple at Jerusalem. And uh, that was the fulfillment of a prophecy that Jesus had talked about in Matthew 24. Uh, so <clears throat> um, 
it does seem that before that happened, uh, Rome were quite happy to let everything happen as it did or was, so long as the tax quota came through to Rome on time and the full amount, they pretty much left all those people doing what they wanted to do and trying to survive. The problem was that everybody who handled the tax money, and there was quite a few of them, they would all take their cut. And so the grassroots were really struggling under the control of Rome through all of the other sort of ways that things, that, that things went. And so they struggled, and, and so life was really tough. Now, for the Jewish people, there was another layer of control. It was the Sanhedrin. And, and they were always very eager to keep the peace and squash any uh, Jewish initiative for riot or, or uprising because they had quite a bit of religious freedom under this system, but it was still ruled from Rome. So the, the Jewish people really believed that when Messiah came, he would kick the Romans out and he would bring a new a wave, a new day, uh, and it would be like the rule of King David. And, and there would be freedom to practice the Jewish faith and to live in peace. So the makeup of the Sanhedrin, the, they were um, members of the high priestly family. They were the Pharisees who embraced the Old Testament writings. And they were the uh, Sadducees. And, and they only accepted the five books of Moses, which was Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And then there was the scribes. They were the people, you know, they were the copy machines in the day because they copied the scriptures. And there was a group called the Essence, and they were a very strict and tight group who, who meticulously observed every little point of the law of Moses. And so the Sanhedrin was made up of a number of between 70 and 100 people. And this group was the group that Jesus appeared before, after he was arrested in Gethsemane. And so it was uh, the highest Jewish court in that day, and it sat in that kind of order. So, I mean, we complain about having government, one government. Goodness me, there's three layers of control. There's a lot of oppression going on here. So uh, now back to Acts chapter 5, and uh, we're picking it up from verse 17. And this is about the impact Holy Spirit was having through the apostles at the time. Not just Peter and John, but all of the apostles were involved in this. Uh, verse 17, then the high priest and his associates who were members of the party of the, Sanhedrin, of, the, of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in a public jail. Now, the Sadducees could do that, you see, because they ran the temple. They were responsible for the security and the safety of the people and the temple and the correct practices of the sacrifices and the behavior of the people in all the areas of the temple. So why were they jealous? Well, we're not really sure why, but... My guess is, or lots of people have guessed, that it was because, one thing was because the apostles were not trained in their Jewish law school. Um, now they, the apostles were very popular due to their teachings about Jesus and all the miracles and amazing things that were happening at that time. But also the religious leaders were being blamed for Jesus' death and they were pretty keen to wipe their slate and prove that they were right. So the apostles, so to the apostles, their attitude was, this is our turf, you guys. Why are you doing the stuff that we haven't done? And they probably felt very threatened about all the wonderful things that were happening around them. So the apostles are in prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the, uh, uh, in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. 
At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. Isn't that amazing? They're back to work, thanks to the Holy Spirit. When the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of, of Israel, and they s- sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers couldn't find them. So they went back and reported. We found the jail security, securely locked, the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On, on hearing this report, the, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They, didn't, they, didn't, they did not use force because they feared the people would stone them. I love this scene. <laughs> Here's the Sanhedrin ready to preside over this case. They send for the prisoners. Oops, there's none. The prison holds no apostles. That's such a miracle, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? How do you get 12 men out of prison in the middle of the night all at the same time? Maybe you could scheme for one or two to, be, to escape, but all 12 of them? And it, I find this so exciting and so amazing and so inspiring because as I read it through several times, it just struck me what a wonderful picture this is of the action of Holy Spirit. He cleaned out the prison and he set the apostles free from that, a prison, from that prison imprisonment because he just loves to break us out of our prisons and set us free. Why? Oh, so as we can feel good? So as we can feel clever or smart? So as we can feel, ha, 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 we're right? No, not at all. It was not about their comfort, nor about the foc- them focusing on themselves. It was to engage with Holy Spirit to do the will and the work of the Father, and the prison they were in was getting in the way of doing that work. And so it is today that the prisons we find ourselves in get in the way, in fact, mostly block what the Father wants to happen in the world and the place that we live and function in. It seems to me that it's been rather a rough ride for us all over the past 12 years or so with earthquakes and those awful, long aftershocks and then insurance claims for most of us and then lies and misinformation and struggles with so many things as we tried to adjust to a new normal. And then, the mosque massacre. And then, COVID, with sickness and lockdowns. And then conflict about, uh, conflict about vaccinations. And we had demonstrations. We even had a riot that we haven't seen for years in New Zealand. And now, a flu epidemic and an overloaded health system. And then added to that, inflation going out of control and on rapid, a rapid rise and costs are going crazy. And then we're having to adjust to a different new normal almost every day. And the other stuff. Oh, and the disaster last night, of course. Oh, I was expecting to read the news this morning that the coach had resigned. Whatever, let's not go there. <clears throat> We have to adjust to a new normal. We're not the most important, best rugby um, country in the world. It's awful. Uh, So anyway, this has resulted, or might still, result in super doses of, supercharged doses of fear and distress and anxiety and worry and arguments and the like these past 12 years. 
Uh, and one of the significant results is th of this is that we have learned to focus on ourselves. Uh, more about what I need, more about my fears, more about my anxieties, more about safe, my safety, more about my health, more about my financial concerns than ever before. And we can even be anxious about being anxious. We can even be afraid about being afraid. It just seems to have built a huge wall of stuff that we have to work, that bears down upon us and we need to work through. And for many of us, this is like a prison because we now feel restricted and, and sometimes even feel like the, the walls of life are pressing in upon us. We have been through some rough waters, that's for sure. Will God come in a miraculous way and change all these circumstances? Will he bring us peace and prosperity and smooth out the waters locally, nationally, or internationally? I don't think so. So how should we respond then? Well, just like the apostles did. The oppression that they were living under, the rule that they were living under, how did they respond? Well, get out of prison and do the work of God in our space. Each and every day. And if God chooses to change the circumstances, he'll do that. But if not, it doesn't change what we need to do, focus on. The mission of the Father that he's called us to do. And the early church leaders were not always rescued from prison, I might add. But we'll see that later in the book of Acts. But their hearts were free. Their spirits were alive to work with Holy Spirit regardless of the circumstances. They were focused on a mission much greater than their own personal issues. They were focused on a world of people who needed to see Jesus. And for me, this is the challenge from this passage of Scripture in this book of Acts today. Get out of prison and do the work of God in our space this day, this week, next week. Sorry, that's easy to say. What might that look like? Well, perhaps we could grow an aura like Peter did, as Josh explained last week. Wouldn't that be something? Walk down the street and all these people behind you are, are just being healed and, 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 and restored and miracles happening. Wouldn't that be amazing? Maybe. But the work of God is not all about the spectacular stuff. It's not just about the miracles and healings and deliverances although these are a vital part of what we're about. It's helping people find Jesus. And that always takes a miracle or ten. And helping them and each other to su survive whatever circumstances we are in. Helping other people to break out of their prisons and follow in his ways, even especially when it's tough and rough going, and uh, sometimes interrupted by amazing acts of God. What a journey we're called to. So the question is, what prisons am I in that are holding me back from doing the work and the will of God? Not, uh, uh, sorry, now, today, tomorrow, and this week. Well, the mark of a Christian in the world that we live in is, uh, is that our lives move to a different rhythm than the culture we live in. And, and Jesus said something like this in Luke 6. It's critically important for us today that we love our enemies instead of sending them abusive Facebook messages. We do good the, to those who hate us. We bless those who curse us, those that badmouth us or lie about us. We bless them. We pray for, not against, those who mistreat us. We give to anyone who asks. I love how the message puts this. Jesus said, love your enemies. Um, 
uh, help and, and give without expecting return, you'll never, I promise, regret that. And then he says this, live out this God-centered identity the way our Father lives towards us, generously, graciously, even when we're at our worst. Oh, when I'm at my worst, I think God thinks, oh, I'm looking the other way. It's so bad. But no, he is, even when I'm at my worst, my, our Father is kind. So you be kind. This kind of action can only come from relationship with our Father because he is, his love is the source of our action. And this action can be things that other people may never see, may never read about, may never hear about. And if you look hard enough, there's a lot of that going on in the book of Acts, behind the scenes. Scenes in the early church, not only miracles and spectacular stuff. But let me be clear, uh, there's no way I want to downgrade the miracles and healings and deliverances, not one bit. But we need an increase in both. Both these things need to grow. So we seem to have learned in the past few years to, to focus more on what I need uh, than to care for others and what they need. I must confess that other people seem to have more of the spectacular stuff happen with them than I do. And the stories that I read about and hear about usually have obvious, immediate, and miraculous results. But for me, it's usually a bit like this. It was the last day of work before Christmas a few years ago, and we managed to finish up at work about mid-afternoon. So I headed off to the mall on my way home, probably to buy a coffee and a last-minute Christmas present. I should remember those Christmas presents, shouldn't I? And as I was locking my bike into the bike rack, a rather agitated guy in his mid to late 20s asked me for some money to buy some petrol because his ute or pickup truck, whatever you want to call it, had run out of petrol, and he said he had no money and he was trying to get home to his mum for Christmas. This guy was wheeling a BMX bike, and on the other hand, he had a red petrol can. You know those red things. Um, so he looked reasonably genuine that he'd actually run out of petrol, so he jumped on his bike to see if he could find some money and some petrol. But he was incredibly distressed, and, and, and he was very intense, and he was speaking so fast and loud I had trouble understanding what it was all about. It wasn't just my hearing aids. I asked him to calm down, take a breath, and start again, which he did attempt to do. But it only lasted about two seconds before his agitation swamped him again. I did hear, I need money for petrol. I said, look, I've got no cash, which was absolutely true because I very seldom ever carry cash on me. But that seemed to increase his stress levels. So I said, look, there's a, there's a petrol station about a kilometre away. You follow me on your bike, and I'll fill up your can for petrol. When we got to the service station, I filled his can and I, uh, uh, with petrol, and I paid by card, because I did have my credit card with me. But his stress levels and his, his anxiety were still very, very high. And now he's talking about needing a toilet. He wanted to wash his face, and he hadn't eaten. So I pointed out where the toilets were in the service station. I went next door to Subway and bought some food and a bottle of water. Back at our bikes, he'd started to slow down just a bit. But now he was starting to tell me that he had no job and, and he wasn't sure what things were going to do and it all started to wind him up again. Well, employment can't be sold one day before Christmas, believe me. I managed to get a few words in about the fact that he now had petrol, he had water, he had food. So take a deep breath, calm the farm, take some water, eat some food, put the petrol in your ute, and go visit your mum for Christmas. Well, he did pause for a moment, so I put my hand on his shoulder, and I said, I trust you have a great Christmas with your mum, and left. And as I rode away, I remember thinking, what on earth was that about, Lord? Did I do the right thing? Did I do enough? Did I fail? I saw no evidence. 
I just left. The only thought that seemed to come to my troubled mind at that point was, just leave it to me. So why am I telling you this totally unspectacular story and not a story with an amazing ending with this guy calming down, being emotionally healed and coming to know Jesus on the garage full court? Well, simply because to the human eye, this is totally unspectacular. And because I firmly believe that I and probably most of us here believe that when we don't see amazing results right in front of us right now, we feel like we've failed. We've done the wrong thing. We don't have enough faith. We should have done it a different way. And sometimes we can play it over and over in our head again about what we could have done or should have done or might have done and end up full of fear that we've failed. This can be a prison, these failures, that block us from doing the will of God. I don't know what happened that day. I still don't. But I do feel, and I did feel at the time, I did all I should have done. And sometimes this is what the work of God is actually like. And just because it's not spectacular, it's no less important. It's like praying for miracles and healings and for deliver deliverances. We tend to expect the fireworks right now, right in this place, immediately and obviously. And when they don't, we end up in failure. You know, of course, that many of the miracles Jesus did are not recorded. If you doubt me, read John 21, 25. Others were very quiet and private. He sent people out of the room at times. He, he prayed very privately for uh, Peter's mother-in-law, and she was healed. And if you go through the miracles, there's some that are very quiet. Nobody knew who, who sorted the wine out at the wedding. What was that about? While others were very public. Some were very loud. You imagine Lazarus coming out of the tomb. That was pretty loud. And there were, and, and a lot of them, some of them were full of fireworks. Fireworks from the religious leaders. Fireworks from the demons. Fireworks from the crowd. And so Holy Spirit, I believe, wants to come to each one of us today and say to us, John, I see you. I see who you are. I see all your fears. I see your life. I see your concerns about failures. I see all your worries. I see all of the details of your prison. And just like the apostles, he wants to lead us out of our prisons, whatever they are. Especially today, those of fear and anxiety and worry and failures. But not only today, but every day. So that we can refocus on the will of the Father as Holy Spirit works in us and through us. So, this morning, there's really just two things. One, get out of prison. And the Holy Spirit is here to help with that because this can be tough and sometimes needing a miracle or ten. And then secondly, learn some skills to stay out of prison. Every day, if you write down two or three things that you are grateful for, different things, blessings from God. I tried this for a month when I was at a fairly low point. For a whole month, every day, I wrote down three different things that I was grateful for. And kind of at the end of it, looking back, I wondered why I stopped. But I proved the point.
it absolutely helps. Stay out of prison when we are grateful for the blessings that God has given us. And the more you look for them, the more you'll find. And then refocus on the mission. Get our eyes off ourselves. I know it's important to think about our health and all those kind of things, but it's getting too much. It's getting way out of, it's out of balance. And that's what I believe we need to learn this morning, to refine the balance in God about ourselves and about the mission we're called to and about the prisons we've ended up in. And so that's kind of the end. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us. Thank you that you quite miraculously ripped those apostles out of prison and no one knew anything about it. What a miracle. And you can do that for each one of us today and every day. Thank you for your greatness and your goodness to us. Amen. I'd like us to, um, we haven't done this for quite a while, is to get into some small groups. And I've got two or three questions I'd like you to go through. So um, if you could find somebody, um, two or three or four people just close by, you know, turn around and shift the furniture and, and um, if you need to, and go talk. Go, if, if you want to go and, and, and be in a group with someone in particular, please do that. And uh, I'll put up some things on the screen here to uh, um, pray for each other. Um, pray for release or refocus or both out of the prisons if you feel you can do that with the people in your group. Uh, and then share two or three things about the things that you're grateful for God about. So could we just do that now as we come to a, the kind of the end of this? And then when your group is finished, if, if that's all you feel you can do, uh, you don't have to stick to those questions. Uh, they may not be appropriate for you, so feel free to do that. But three or four people, otherwise <coughs> it can take a bit long. Um, but if you want time, feel free to do that. And so thank you for coming. And when you're finished, God bless you.